Hey everyone, we're Billy and Courtney Starkey. Welcome to Grace Church. Good morning. We hope you're doing well. It's officially spring outside. Billy, what is one thing that you love about the change in season? The thing I love the most about the change in seasons is my allergies that come when all the pollen hits. Okay, um, good answer. What do you love about spring? Hey, that's not really my real answer, but we'd love to hear from you. Let us know how you're enjoying the warmer weather in the comments. Also, if you're a guest with us today, no matter how you stumbled upon our page, thanks for stopping by. We're glad you're here. Because you're a guest, we'd like to welcome you with a small gift. Text hello to the number you see on the screen and we'll get that gift sent to you. Coming up today, we'll continue our brand new series called Family Matters by talking about marriage. We'll learn tools that, no matter what your relationship status is, will help you set yourself up for a God-honoring marriage. I'm really excited about the message on marriage, because here's the thing, we all have priorities, but those priorities are oftentimes in the wrong place. Today, we'll see that when we make God our number one and our spouse our number two, we're setting ourselves up for a lifelong marriage. And by the end of our time together, we'll be walked through some practical ideas to make our marriages matter more, which I'm really excited to try. So let's join Matt and the band as we kick off the morning in worship with the song, My Hallelujah. We'll see you right after the service. Good to see you today. Why don't you get on your feet, join us in worship. Celebrate Jesus. Open up the doors again. Let the King of glory in. His kingdom will never end. Oh, I know that you are good. Break the darkness with the light. All the earth let praise arise Every dead place come alive Oh, I know that you are good Oh, I know that you are good You will have my hallelujah You alone the highest name
love the message of that song, that it's a reminder that everything that I have, all that I am, is an expression of praise to God. I'm glad to be a part of a church that encourages my life in that way, and I hope that you are too. Go ahead and have a seat. Well, good morning. We are David and Julie Lawson, and we are super excited to be here with you today. Whether you're joining us online or you are here in the room, you're in the right place because God has something just for you today. We're in a series called Family Matters. And a little bit later, Pastor Nick is going to be sharing with us why God's design for marriage matters. You know, David and I have been married for 36 years. We've been growing, we've been learning, and we've been loving it more every day. Yeah, and probably just about every married couple, people who are married, they would probably say, our relationship isn't perfect, my marriage isn't perfect. And press a little bit more, even though they love one another deeply, there might be some habits, there might be some behaviors that might get a little annoying every now and then. Maybe they wish they would change. And, you know, surprisingly, maybe not surprisingly these days, uh, people are willing to put it on social media and they even tweet about it. So uh, t check out these tweets. Ah, here's the first one. It says, I don't want to talk about it until you're about to fall asleep. Yeah, that not a fan of that. Me. Not a fan of that. Yeah. Don't like it. How about this one? After many heart-to-heart -heart talks, my husband and I have finally decided that at this stage in our marriage to go ahead and get separate tubes of toothpaste. Yeah, probably now good Now I idea. agree with that. Yeah, I think that's probably a good <laughs> idea. I, <laughs> I like this one, guys. You like this one. Your wife says, uh, we have to go to Kohl's today so I can spend $5 Kohl's cash before it expires. The husband's saying, I'll give you 10 bucks if you just stay home. You'll be, yeah, you'll be ahead. You'll be ahead in the long run. Just keep her home. Give her 10 bucks. Keep her home. It's just a lot easier that way. You know, it's good just to laugh at yourself a little bit in any relationship, not just in marriage, but in any relationship. And uh, whether you've been married uh, 50 years or whether you've been married five years or one year or whether you are single, you're, you're going to pull something out of today that's going to help you in every relationship that you are in. So I hope you're going to be leaning in and expecting God to do something in your own life, in your own heart. Mm, but before we get to that, let's continue with some worship. We're going to celebrate who Jesus is and what he has done. So why don't you stand with us as we continue to worship? Yeah. 
search the world but it couldn't fill me man's empty praise and treasures of faith never enough often you came along put me back together Every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Yeah, oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Yes, I know.
than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. that God can take something that's negative, that's hopeless, that's dead, and he can use it and transform it into something that's positive, full of life and joy, and only he can do it. Thank you, Jesus. You can go ahead and have a seat. You know, I know that many of you are aware of because of COVID last fall, our schools were doing a variety of things as far as were kids in person or were they online. And you know that Worcester City Schools did a hybrid of that. And here at Grace Church, we were able to host an alternative learning center so kids, when they were not on campus at school, could be here on our campus. And what a blessing that was for our community, our teachers, our students, our parents. It was really cool. And I want to read you a thank you note from a child, um, Brayden, who was here. And he said, Dear Grace Church, thank you for letting us play on your playground and on your computers and in your space and for your gym. That was very kind of you to let us use your stuff. <laughs> it was really a cool opportunity, yes, to be able to provide that for them and be a blessing. Thank you. And I love that about uh, our church's involvement, the positioning that God has given to us to be a blessing to our community, to be for our community, to be for families, to be for individuals, and just glad that we can partner with them in that way. And if you've contributed in any way financially to the ministry here at Grace, you were a partner in that. You, you helped with that. And that's one of the things I love about a financial investment in the ministry here at Grace is that uh, not only it allows us to be for Wayne County, but for the world. We have ministry around the world. And so if giving is your next step, there are some options on the screen you can take advantage of and uh, allow you to take that next step in your spiritual journey. Because it is a spiritual step when you think about it. Because the God is really clear that whenever we give financially, uh, we are putting our trust in him. It allows us to invest in, in uh, our worship of him. And so it is a good step in your spiritual journey. I hope that you'll go ahead and take that if you haven't yet taken that step. I just love to be a part of that. Julie and I give on a regular basis here, and uh, we just really appreciate the chance to invest in the ministry of God and in his person and what he's trying to accomplish in and through our church. So why don't you bow with me in prayer. Thank you, Father, for the chance to invest in things that matter, uh, things that ultimately will bring life change in the lives of people, provide hope and encouragement to their lives. And uh, I thank you for this morning, a chance for us also to have this investment placed in our lives, that if we take these truths that we're going to be learning and put them into practice, there'll be an investment that will make a difference in us and in those who are around us. Thank you for that opportunity. Thank you for the chance of our church to invest in our community like we have over this past uh, school year. We're grateful for that opportunity, and we're also grateful for how you've allowed our, our influence as a church to make an impact in the lives of people even around the world. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for those opportunities. Thank you for investing in us in the person of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
Well, hello and thanks again for being here. Week two in the series Family Matters, right? And last week we talked about that we all have titles that we want to live up to the role and the responsibility of those. If you took the challenge to live up like many of you did, I hope that you found that uh, research and that survey helpful for you. Today we're going to talk about the fact that marriage matters. One of those titles in the family is husband and wife. Now, I know that not everybody watching this message or listening to this message, that not everyone is married. And so I don't want you to tune out because I believe that you're going to be blessed by this no matter what season you're in. And we all want this. If we're married, we want what we're going to talk about today for our marriage. If we're not married, we want this for the people we know who are married. And I especially want to talk to the kids. Kids, if you're listening to the message today, I want you to hang on because I need your help at the very end. You're going to have to hang with me to the very end, but I need your help with something, okay? Because the truth is that marriage matters, and it matters to God, and it should matter to us. And we think about marriage, we think about love. We think about love, we think about couples. We think about couples, we think about TV couples, right? The, the couples that have drawn us in. And you can think back to the couple of your generation on the screen. You know, like uh, Mike Brady, right, that brought the two families blended together as one. And all I can think of is Marsha, 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 right, from the Brady Bunch, right? They just seemed like the perfect marriage, right? They could always figure out a problem in 30 minutes or less. It was amazing, right? You can think about how those couples have portrayed love for us. And that's so important because each one of us, we crave love. We want to be loved, and we want to show love. Love is in a deep core, a desire and drive for every single one of us. And so when we see it portrayed on the TV, we're drawn to it, and, and producers, they know that. But it goes even further than that, right? When these celebrities go off screen, we're even obsessed with their love and relationships off the screen. And a few years ago, these celebrity couples that would come together somewhere in our culture, we decided to stop using the word and when describing them as names, right? And we just kind of mashed it all together, right? Like Tom Cat, Tom and Katie, right? But my favorite is Benefer. Uh, for Ben Affleck, because he's got a thing for Jennifer's, right? Benefer 1 and Benefer 2, right? Just kind of just goes for him, right? We just smash it all together. Now, the truth of the matter is, as is, is cute and as obsessed we are with all of this, these couples who have everything, everything that we could want as a culture, yet they're not together anymore. Uh, they drifted apart. They're no longer married uh, they've spent more than you could even imagine on all of their weddings. If you Google it, you'll see hundreds of thousands of dollars, and a few of them even spent a million dollars on their wedding celebration because they are the perfect couple who wants the perfect wedding. And if you've been around the block <laughs> at least once, you know there's no such thing. There's no such thing as the perfect wedding. There's no such thing as the perfect couple. There's no such thing as the perfect marriage. Because there's people involved and we're not perfect. And, and yet sometimes we still strive to see that picture perfect wedding experience, right? Maybe you're planning a wedding right now and you want it to go just uh, perfectly, right? But the problem is there's different expectations between men and women. Uh, like this is really what guys and girls are thinking their wedding ceremony should look like, right? It's just totally different expectations. And then you're going to have people in your wedding party who don't want to be there. They don't want to be there at all, right? They don't want to be a part of it, and you're going to stress over that. And then you invited that one cousin on his side who's going to be at the reception, right? And you're like, wow, definitely told you we shouldn't have invited him. And then you're going to go after that perfect picture, that moment. They're going to go a little too far into that dock, and it's going to be an issue, right? We chase after this perfect ideal, and yet it isn't the perfect ideal. Instead, God has a perfect ideal, and we can all be guilty of allowing that picture-perfect wedding to overshadow the needs of a relationship in marriage. We can treat marriage like the wedding's more important, when in reality, marriage is such an important commitment and stop in the game of life. We don't want to chase after the world ideal of perfect, but instead God's ideal. You know, the United States has one of the highest divorce rates in the world. 750,000 Americans will likely file for divorce in one year. 
Somewhere between 40 and 50% of all marriages end in divorce. The average length of marriage is just over eight years. The divorce rate for those who are 50 or over has doubled. For 65 and over has tripled recently. And experts tell us that in the middle of the pandemic and related measures, we saw a spike in divorce because everyone was forced to be at home. And so here's the thing. No one ever starts their marriage expecting that it will end in divorce. No one ever walks into my office as a young couple wanting to get married and says, hey, listen, pastor, we don't really think it's going to work out, but we're going to give it a go and we'll see how it turns out, right? No, none of them walk in with that. So what in the world happens? I'll tell you what happens. Expectations and reality. And they get further and further and further apart. It might be absolutely unrealistic expectations where someone has too high of a standard that nobody could hit. It might be unbelievable reality with pain and struggle and frustration. And what happens is the further apart expectations and reality get, there's this gap. And in marriage, we might call it the drift, where we just drift apart, right? And we don't know how to solve. We don't know how to wade into. We don't know how to fix that gap. And that gap makes us frustrated and angry and unresolved anger. Listen to me. The gap is not kids. The gap is not money. The gap is not sex. The gap is your expectations with all of it. And unresolved anger is the number one threat to every relationship you will ever have, including marriage. And so today... I want to challenge us to fight against that drift. To push back together what God wants to be united. We're going to have to fight against the temptation to go uh, away from each other. Fight that expectation and reality and bring it back together. Learn how to resolve that unresolved anger. I want all of us to make our marriage matter more. I believe that if you're listening to this message, you believe that marriage matters. And that's good. But I want you to make it matter more. I want you to go one step further than you've gone when you walked into the room or you tuned in today. I want you to go one step more to make your marriage matter. To make that daily investment. To follow through on that God-honoring commitment. And to prioritize your relationship. Marriage is very challenging. But it's also incredibly rewarding. And so if we're going to do that, we're going to make our marriage matter more, we're going to have to lean in to God's ideal for marriage. We're going to have to get on the same page with expectations about what God says about marriage. The first thing that God gives us is the purpose for marriage. We're going to have to be on the same page when it comes to the purpose of marriage. Comedian Rita Rudder said, I've been married, or I love being married. It's so great to find that one special person that you want to annoy the rest of your life, right? Another person described marriage as that when you agree to spend the rest of your life sleeping in a room that's too warm next to a person that's sleeping in a room that's too cold, right? That's not funny, but those aren't the purposes of marriage. Last week, we discovered, if you were uh, tuned in with us last week. If you haven't, you should go back and watch it. We discovered that marriage uh, is from the very beginning. It's a part of the creation order of God. And sometimes in our culture, what gets kind of tagged as old-fashioned is truly God-fashioned. And it's God that wants one man and one woman to come together for one lifetime in this ideal called marriage. And one time Jesus was having an interaction with some of the religious leaders, and they were trying to trap him like they normally did. And they said, hey, Jesus, is it okay for us to file for divorce for any reason? Like, just out of convenience. And Jesus answers them by quoting Genesis, the creation order. Jesus says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they'll no longer be two, but one flesh. And maybe this was said at your wedding. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Let no one tear apart. How do you know if someone's married? Do you walk up to them and you see a ring on their finger so you know they're married? Or do you walk up to them and you say, hey, can you show me your marriage certificate? 
No. You see the fruit of that relationship in their life. That's how you know that they're married. And yet today we treat marriage like a convenience expressing itself in our own desires by a piece of paper that's signed by a judge. But we want a covenant of commitment that expresses itself in self-sacrificing love. That's what we all want, but we treat it more like a contract than a covenant. And Jesus is saying, now listen, marriage is not a contract of temporary convenience, a union that can be dissolved on a whim, but a lifelong commitment, a lifelong commitment between a man and a woman. Marriage is a covenant or a promise, not a contract. When you treat marriage like a contract, you go into it, you're like, I don't really know you that well. I don't really trust you, and so we're going to put on paper your responsibility and mine, and if you don't live up to your end of the bargain, I'm not going to live up to my end of the bargain. We treat marriage like we would an apartment lease. Jesus says, no, 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 no. It's a covenant. It's totally different. It's based on a mutual commitment before a holy God. You think about a covenant that God has made with mankind. He loved us so much that he wanted to enter into an unconditional love relationship with us. And as a symbol, he sent his son Jesus to die to secure that relationship. He gave his very best for us, and we didn't deserve it. In the Old Testament, when a couple would get married, uh, the priest would cut the hands of the couple, and he'd put them together, and he would tie them, symbolizing the sacrifice that each person would bring to this level of a relationship. That's what marriage is. It's a picture of God's sacrificial love for us. You go all the way back to Genesis, what Jesus is quoting here, and that first couple, they, they walked around the Garden of Eden together. They knew God. They knew each other. They enjoyed the intimacy and companionship and affection of each other. Their marriage vows began with, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, right? They had this joy of being together. That's how it was. And we learn in marriage that a husband's self-sacrificial love for his wife is a picture of God's sacrificial love for his bride, the church. Our marriages are a window through which the world can see God's love. Because you and I were created to be connected to God. The only ultimate fulfilling and satisfying relationship that you'll ever experience is a relationship with God through Jesus. Your marriage cannot fully and finally satisfy you. Your spouse is not created to do that. Only God is. And your marriage will struggle until you have that relationship with God. And you anchor that in who he is and how he satisfies you. And I know that not everyone listening to this message has that relationship yet that is available through Jesus' death on the cross to secure our forgiveness. And I just want to tell you, if you do not have that relationship yet, make today, make that a priority today. You can text the name Jesus to the number on your screen, and we would love to have a conversation with you about how you can have that relationship. Once you have that relationship... You are primed for not just the picture of marriage, but the gift of marriage. And the gift of marriage is connected to what Jesus said right here. It's this idea that the two are brought together. They're united. In the Genesis account, the original word literally means to be glued together. And you've got to think about in marriage, the purpose of marriage is to be united in this friendship. This unity doesn't come from an IRS exemption. It doesn't come from great communication. Those are all benefits. It comes from a commitment. A commitment to each other. And so when we're committed to God and his ideal, we understand that marriage is from God as a gift and it's for God. It's not about my needs. I remember standing at the altar when I got married and, and my pastor and mentor looked at me in the eyes and goes, Nick, it's not about you anymore. It's not about your agenda. It's now about Vicki. Her needs come before your very own. And when we live out the purpose of marriage... People get to see the beauty, the mercy, and the grace of God alive. Because marriage is between two very imperfect people. 
And we get to show them the love and grace of God. So you begin with the purpose. And then you're ready to chase after the priority of marriage. The priority. There's definitely an order in which relationships are to function in life. A few weeks ago, Baylor University men's basketball team won the national championship. And we, we watched the game, and they celebrated afterwards. And after they were done celebrating and cutting down the nets, they handed the coach the trophy. And this is what he said. Coach Scott Drew, he said, We play with a culture of joy. That's Jesus others than yourself. It's so tough to put other people in front of you, and teams that do that are obviously more successful culture of joy, a priority of relationship. There's no greater team than when a husband and wife come together. That's an incredible team. And there's a priority for that as well. It's a priority that's given to us. It begins by making sure that the foundational piece of our relationship is our relationship with Jesus. It's the, it's the biggest block in our life. And, and we want to make sure that we have this relationship secure. Remember last week we learned in Deuteronomy 6. Jesus quoted it and said, this is what summarizes all the law and the prophets. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Right? He goes, that's the greatest commandment in all. Is to have a relationship of love with Jesus. Then... You're able to love others like Jesus would love others. Jesus said the second commandment is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So there's a priority, a foundation of God first. Then our relationships with others. And in marriage, marriage has a way of fitting into this level of priorities. Marriage is the primary relationship that you have on earth. Your marriage comes before your career. Your marriage is to come before your kids. Your marriage is to come before your hobby. Your marriage is a priority as it relates to others. And then ultimately, the smallest block on purpose is yourself. Right? Jesus, others, and you. Now this is a package deal. Some people don't want to take care of themselves very well. And they feel like they, can de- they don't have a lot of self-value because they don't have this understanding of who they are in Jesus. And so they don't feel lovable and therefore they struggle loving other people. So it is important to take care of yourself. Jesus even says, uh, you take care of yourself, guys, because you feed yourself and clothe yourself. So obviously you care about yourself. But this is the smallest block. Jesus, others, and you. Marriage is from God. It's for God. And it always is to come first after God. That's the priority of marriage. That's the priority of God's ideal together. And so if we're going to live out that priority, it's going to begin where the Apostle Paul taught the Ephesians. It's going to begin with this idea of submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. We'll call this mutual submission. Now, as soon as I say submission and I say submit, there's people like panicking in the room, right? That's not a word that our culture likes to hear today. And I understand it because there's been some abuse and misuse of this word and of this in marriages and relationships. And that abuse and misuse of it is not God's ideal. What the word submit means is to bring yourself under the authority of someone. And we're all as followers of Christ to do that. We're to bring ourselves under the authority of the leadership of Jesus. It requires a spirit of humility. And in Paul's day, you have to understand what he's calling for here, for a husband and wife to submit to one another. You have to understand the context of what's going on in his world. First of all, women in this day were treated like servants. Nothing better. In the Roman Empire, which was the leadership of the day, there was so much promiscuity going on. It was running rampant. They would just treat women like sex objects. And against that backdrop, Paul says, no, no, no. Husbands and wives, mutual submission. You're not supposed to go 50% in and they're supposed to go 50% in. It's 100% out of both of you. I want you to live in total contrast to what the world around you lives. God's priority for marriage is a hundred hundred plan, all in, whatever it takes to make it work. From this day forward, for better or for worse, 
in sickness and in health, for richer, for poorer, forsaking all others, I'll be faithful to you so long as we both shall live. That's the priority of marriage. This mutual submission together. And Paul says off of that we can build a healthy relationship. And he gives specific instructions to husbands and wives. First to the wives, he says, So wives, submit yourselves to your own husband as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, in which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. And so wives, God has this ideal instruction for you to submit. Now, submission starts with surrender to God. When I'm telling you, you could argue with me and call it old-fashioned, I'm going to come right back and say it's God-fashioned. Wives are not expected to submit to their husbands who would ask them to do something that is outside the bounds of God's will and his plan. And I get that this is tough because there are some men that are complete jerks and they treat this in an egotistical manner and that is not honoring to God on any level. But men, when we lead through service, we make it easier for our wives to say, I want to follow that. When we love our wives unconditionally and they are absolutely secure, they're like, man, I want to go with that. Listen, I wake up every day and I want, I want to make it as easy as possible for Vicky to say, I want to follow after him. That means I put her before me. I don't do that every day. If she's up here, she'd tell you. But that's the standard. Now, men and women are equal before God, but we have different roles in marriage. And so then Paul continues and he gives specific instructions to husbands. He goes, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. And present and to present her to himself as a radiant, without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. We just talked about this a minute ago. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. Men, this is a call to rise up to love our wives unconditionally, to love your wife more than yourself, to love your wife more than your business or your career, to love your wife more than your hobby or your teams, to love your wife more than your car, to love your wife more than yourself. We're to love our wives as Jesus loved the church, and that standard's pretty high because he died for her. Now, I know a lot of guys who, when they read that, they're like, yeah, absolutely, man. I am totally willing to die for my wife. I would take a bullet for her. And I believe them. And so does their spouse. And that's great. But you want a little secret? I think your wife would rather you would live for her every day than being willing to die for her one time. I think she would be like, yeah. I'm shocked I didn't get any amens out of women right there. But you know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> To live sacrificially, to take the lead, to become more like Christ. And then the, the benefits will flow in our home. Uh, the bottom line for marriage is that men and women come at this from totally different perspectives. Uh, we look at the world differently, right? But Paul says at the end of this teaching, the bottom line is this. Each one of you men should love your wife as he loves himself. And the wife must respect her husband. Love and respect. Love and respect. The thing that closes that gap, the thing that fights against that drift is love and respect. You fulfill the purpose of marriage by prioritizing love and respect. Marriage is from God, and it's for God, and it always comes first after God. That's the purpose and the priority of marriage. And this is what I know. None of us are perfect at this. I'm not asking you to be perfect. I know that God's ideal makes, uh, makes you feel like you can't measure up and the pressure's heavy. 
What I'm trying to do is use that to say, hey, listen, would you allow God to prompt in your spirit to make your marriage matter more? Instead of running away from the ideal, will you be inspired by it? No one's perfect. No one has it figured out. There's many couples in our church that are fighting against the drift to try to make their marriage matter even more. And today I want you to hear the story of one couple who's fighting to make their marriage matter more in our church. This is the story of Chad and Sasha Kaufman. I'm Chad Kaufman, and this is my wife, Sasha. And uh, we've been married for 21 years, uh, just a few days ago. And we have three boys. They're 16, 15, and 9. We actually met here at Grace and started dating when I was 16 and she was 15. 15. We got married pretty much a few months after graduating college. And um, <laughs> it, was a, it was a rough start. We maybe had an unrealistic view of what marriage would be like. Just sort of the realities of like, oh, marriage takes work. This is what we signed up for here. We were finally together, and it wasn't quite how we thought it was going to be. I think be. that was the first time we really realized that this is not just um, paradise. A romance. Like everything in life, if it's worth doing, it, re it takes work. And a marriage is a perfect example of that. You can get to this place to where if you're not intentional and investing and continuously investing in that, relationship that I've had for so long that um, you can naturally tend to drift. A few years ago, uh, we arrived at this place of saying, you know, our kids are teenagers now, a few years they're going to be out of the house, and, um, you know, if we had to rank ourselves where we're at in our relationship, where are we at? And I think we were both at a place where we were like, we're not where we want to be. So we moved into this this uh, this spot where we said, you know, let's get some counseling. We can't expect to just kind of be idle and sitting by and letting life go by and expect to come out with a lot of fruit in the end if we haven't been sowing and making an investment there. The counselor said to me, you need to put the same level of effort and intensity into your wife that you put into your businesses. And I started really processing that. And so I started to really focus on putting those same level of efforts into Sasha um, as I do my businesses. And I think that really changed um, our marriage in many ways for the good. This is the surrender, really. Mm -hmm. Surrendering um, that we're gonna come together and ask God to help us do this life and lead this family. I remember trying to set up those boundaries like, okay, God is first in our lives as individuals, but um, second is our relationship, and then third comes the rest of the family. We know that a, a three-stranded um, cord is not easily broken, and you know, it's the two of us and it's God, and you have to have God be a part of your marriage. Amen. I love that they're willing to be open and honest about it not being perfect. We'll all say that in a group, but when your camera's put in your face and you say that, that's a whole nother level. But what they are willing to say is, I, I want to make it better. I want to make it matter more. That's the challenge, to not settle for anything less than God's best. So the challenge today is to make our marriage matter more, to make the investments along the way. Uh, to, to, even though it's, there's ups and there's downs, there's challenges, there's difficulties, all of those things combine to not allow your marriage to go on autopilot and drift apart, but to fight back and say, no, I'm not going to operate like a roommate. I'm going to operate like this is a covenant, right? I'm not going to let busyness drive us apart. I'm not going to let demands from work drive us apart. I'm not going to let all these distractions from social media and technology drive us apart. No, 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 I'm going to fight back. And you can make your marriage matter more by fighting against the drift. You have to take action. It doesn't happen on accident. You have to be intentional and say, no, 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 I'm not going to let that drift happen. Whether you've been married for 30 minutes or 30 years, you get this. You're going to have to make an intentional investment to come together. And I want to help you with that today as we wrap up our time. And so if you're not married, 
this is a great opportunity for you to be looking at this list and going, how can I help the people in my world who are married get here? And kids, if you're a kid, I promise you at the beginning, I, I was going to come back to you, I need your help right now. I'm going to give a list here of about 10 things for your parents, okay, mom and dad to do this week. They have to pick something from it, and I need your help. You need to annoy your parents this week. Can you do that for me? Can you annoy them? I want you to ask them today, okay, ask them today, which one are you guys picking? And when they say to you, we don't know yet, we have to go talk about it, that's fine. Ask them tomorrow. And when they give you the same answer tomorrow, you can say on Tuesday, the pastor told me to annoy you. Okay? And keep asking until they give you an answer. Here are some ideas of how we can fight against this drift. First of all, hang out together. Make an intentional time to do something that you both enjoy doing together. If you're like, well, we don't really have some similar hobbies, great. Find something neither of you like doing and do it together and laugh about it, okay? Just hang out together. Uh, this is a little heavy, but it's true. Why don't you start with forgiving one another for allowing the drift? And just saying, hey, listen, I, I want to start by pausing, putting the phone down and saying, I'm sorry, will you forgive me for not being intentional enough? Because I love you. And I'm in to fight against this drift. And forgive one another. Or how about a double date? Why don't you go out on a double date with another couple who wants to fight against that drift too? You'd be amazed the power of putting people in your world that'll push you towards God's ideal. Don't be shocked when you don't hang out with people that believe that family matters, that it ends up not mattering to you. Double date. How about this one? You could ask questions. Guys, and listen to the answers, right? Ask about what's your dream? How are you feeling right now? What are you thinking about? Where do you want to be in five years? Get the conversation started if it's been a while since you've talked, right? Or here's one, intimacy, right? Marriage is more than sex, but it's a, sex is a big part of marriage. And if it's the one thing that brings couples together, this intimacy, right? It's the thing that God wants for you, and it's the thing that Satan wants to steal. No couple has come into my office with marriage issues, and it hasn't eventually come back to this on some level. Just saying. Or how about hugs and kisses? Just start there. I'm serious. What if you hugged each other and kissed each other to begin and end every day for seven days? It might be pretty cool, and your kids will be like, oh, that's gross. Another reason to annoy your kids. This is a great give and take, right? Or pray together. And this one can be super intimidating, especially for us guys. And, and I promise you guys, the most intimidating part of it is just saying, let's, let's pray. Building the courage that you're not going to know what to say, and the good news is that's okay. God doesn't want your words. He wants your heart. And so just saying, hey, God, the pastor told us to pray. And I love my wife, and I want us to fight the drift. In Jesus' name, amen. She'll probably be crying at that point, and that's okay. But it brings you together, right? Or how about serve each other? Why don't you find something on each other's to-do lists around the house? Like if, if you're to do laundry or ironing or whatever, and you do yard work or whatever, however it works in your family, pick something off the other person's list and just do it. And tell them, hey, I, I, I respect you so much. I'm so thankful for you doing that all the time. And then you can get together and tell each other how much you hated what you did, right? And you'd be like, I told you so. I do it every week, right? How about this one? Be generous. This is an idea. Together, choose to bless someone anonymously. This is a fun game. Give your time, your treasure, or your talent to someone that will be blessed by it. And do it together. Being generous together is an amazing gift, right? Or you could even cook. I just needed one to balance out the two lists. If you like to cook, that's great. Just cook, right? Do something together the whole time. And don't use your phone unless that's where you're getting a your recipe from, right? Just do something together this week. Make an intentional investment. So I've got some ideas. Maybe you got better ones for your, for your marriage, and that's great. But I want to challenge you to go all in, and I need you to respond and say, that's it, I'm in. So if you will text the word marriage and saying, okay, this week in the seven days, get your phones out and do it. Text marriage. In the next seven days, I'm going to do one intentional thing to fight against the drift, the drift that would pull us apart. And all we're going to do is pray for you this week, right? 
Man, can you imagine what could happen? The kind of marriages we could have if we built on this maybe two, three weeks of momentum of just fighting against the drift that happens in all marriages. One intentional investment at a time. Kids, annoy them. Parents, make your marriage matter more. Make your marriage matter more. Marriage is from God and it's for God. And it always comes after God. That's the purpose and priority. And marriage matters. Let's pray together. God, our time together today has been rich and meaningful and good. Thank you for the truth that guides us. That we don't have to assume. We don't have to guess. We have a blueprint from your word on how to make our marriages matter more. And I know when we talk about a topic like this, there's some hurts in the room for marriages that didn't make it. And I pray for your comfort and your peace and your love for those who have struggled. I know there's also unmet expectations of individuals who want to be married. And right here in this moment, God, I ask that you would make your presence real to them and remind them that the most satisfying relationship available to humankind is available to them in Jesus. God, we don't want to idolize marriage. We want to worship you and love each other. Give us courage and boldness this week to make marriage matter more. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What a great message. If you're married, I encourage you to lead by going first. Talk with your spouse and plan to make one investment in your marriage from that list. Or even one you make up. Life is too busy not to fight the drift in marriage. Courtney and I were reflecting on this recently. Uh, we have a 10-month-old son, and so for us, one of the investments we want to make is have a date night that's a priority that we're investing in our relationship together so that we can be the best parents for our son we can be. Whatever the investment is that you want to make in your marriage, make it happen. Don't wait. Make your marriage matter more. Even if you're unmarried, your choices today can be ones that invest in your future. Thanks for joining us today. Remember, God is for you and your family, and we are too. Have a great week.